Good morning. Um, welcome to the uh, School of Computer Science um, Alumni breakfast this year. Um, this is the second time I uh, stand in front of uh, our alumni to talk about our achievements in the school. And uh, um, I think this, this is the second time. And uh, I did one last year because I only joined UTS a year and uh, two months ago. OK, so what's have been changed? What has been changed? We are now called computer science. We, as you probably know, that we used to call ourselves as software, uh, scope software. But when I came here, I decided that uh, with consultation with my staff members, we think that uh, uh, computer science is best name to is the best one to name ourselves. So we decided to move our name to computer science. And of course, the university finally approved it uh, early this year, and we formally launched a uh, uh, event to call ourselves as Computer Science from June 2019. So now we're called Computer Science. And uh, incidentally, after we call ourselves as Computer Science, um, we are ranked as number one in Australia as Computer Science and in the, new, in the most recent ranking. So if you look at the most recent ranking in uh, Shanghai Jiao, uh, the world uh, universities, top universities, we are now ranked 29 in the whole world in computer science and engineering and the number one in Australia. If you look at that, uh, here is the uh, URL. And if you, I, I got, uh, I think that's hopefully it works. And, uh, otherwise, uh, Anyway, come, come for out. But anyway, this is this uh, this is the ranking. For if we go into the URL, you can see that the top one is MIT, of course, and Harvard, some of the other universities. But the first one in Australia, that uh, is UTS. So that's really a great achievement for us. The third one, is that we, our university also approved to establish a new center called Center for Cybersecurity and Privacy that was approved last week. And uh, it's called Center for uh, Cybersecurity and Privacy and uh, we, um, that's probably was about four, 30 people around the university man from our school. And we focus on both sides of security and privacy, including IoT security, uh, privacy as well, that's a location privacy, those sort of things. So um, that's the fourth center in the school. We have the center for AI, center for um, quantum computing and software and uh, 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 analytics, uh, data analytics, advanced analytics institute. And then there's the fourth one called cybersecurity and privacy. So there's really a lot of development in the, uh, in, the, in the school happening. And today, of course, we are going to talk about this another discipline because we have, the school has three disciplines, if you know that. The first one is uh, uh, interaction design had by Andrew. And the second one is uh, AI and uh, data analytics at uh, Paul. And the third one is software engineering headed by uh, Baruch. So uh, today we are going to focus on the topic of interactive design. I give the stage to Andrew. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Wang Wei. Let's bring up my slides. So, it's a relatively small group of us this morning. Um, thank you all very much for coming. Um, it's going to be a little bit informal. Um, I, I, when one day sort of invited me to uh, participate in this breakfast, I was sort of thinking about what topic should we talk about, and um, I was uh, the, the first one that popped into my mind was virtual reality. 
which is my kind of informal term, which might catch on, but I doubt it. Um, in, in, in terms of blending, the, the blending of the virtual worlds and the physical worlds has become a particularly kind of, I think, a particularly kind of interesting topic in recent years with the re, re-emergence of virtual reality and augmented reality and so on. So for me, it's thinking about how we can get the, the magic of digital, how we can make things appear and disappear at will, you know, in a massive, massive scale, but also with that tangibility and natural interaction that we kind of that we get from physical objects. So that was the very broad topic that I kind of hand waved um, in the direction of our wonderful panel. And so what I think we will do this morning is each of us is going to talk for about 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to keep strictly to time, um, especially for myself. And then after that, we will um, throw open to questions from the floor and just sort of a bit of a panel discussion. Um, again, we're a relatively small group, so maybe you don't want to use this, but I have set up Slido. So if you go to slido.com um, on your any device that you have and type in that code 4274, you can type in questions and comments and things like that there that will appear on my screen up here. And well, what I think we'll do is it will, we'll, each of us will present first and we won't take questions at that time. Um, unless there's something really burning, but you can sort of stick your hand up. Um, uh, but after we've all presented, then we will go through the questions that have come through from, from Slido and also any other questions you might just call out. Um, before I get into my sort of presentation proper, I would just like to talk a bit about interaction design at UTS. So we have an undergraduate major and a sub-major. So if you're doing an undergrad Bachelor of Science in IT degree or Bachelor of IT or um, Bachelor of Software Engineering or something like that, you can choose to do a major in interaction design or a sub-major in interaction design. And we currently have around about 500 students enrolled in those, so it's big. A lot of students that are doing interaction design uh, in our undergraduate cohort. We also have a relatively new Master of Interaction Design course that has around about 40 students, I think. Uh, have been a while since I've actually checked the numbers, but it has around about 40. And a great third of interaction design that's kind of partnered with that. We have 13 full-time academic staff in the discipline. And in terms of research, um, we have uh, quite act a very active research um, program as well. Uh, we had, to give you a sense, some sense of the scale, we had a research income of about 1.3 million in 2017-2018. Um, and probably quite a lot more than that um, this coming year. Um, I should also briefly introduce um, our panel. So, um, as we can see in the, in the, I was going to say in the middle there, but Elisa is here, uh, and she's a professor in our school, professor of human computer interaction, and she also has a um, position at Eindhoven University in the Netherlands, so she's often flying between the two places. Um, I, I won't go into, you can read the slide, I won't read it to you, but also Elisa is going to talk about her research in her presentation. Um, and also we have Vivica Wiley, who has probably the coolest um, job title that I've come across for quite a while, the Head of New Things at Choice. Um, so that just goes to show what you can do when you're, someone says here, you can say what it is that you want your job title to be. Um, and Viv also said he's just come from a meeting, like he's been up since 2 a.m. He's been uh, reviewing papers for the SIGGRAPH Asia conference, so there's been a big sort of panel discussion that has been involved with the virtual panel discussion that's involved with as part of that. So thank you very much for, for um, giving us your time this morning, both of you. Okay, so now I can start the timer um, for my 15 minutes, because that first bit doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, so now I'm just going to talk about some research projects I've been involved in, and a bit, um, which all kind of to some extent explore this virtual kind of thing that I'm talking about, about the, the blending between virtual and the digital world, sorry, between the digital, the virtual worlds and the real worlds. And I do this as part of um, my work at the UTS Animal Logic Academy. For those of you that don't know, the UTS Animal Logic Academy is a partnership between Animal Logic, the film and visual effects company that makes like Lego movies and Matrix and Great Gatsby and like pretty much probably every good movie you've seen in the last 25 years. Um, it's a partnership between Animal Logic and UTS. We've made a professionally equipped studio, I'm going to put a photo up, um, here at UTS that has room for about 60 seats. 
we have a better technical setup and a better physical setup than the people at Animal Logic, and they get really like annoyed with us when they come to visit because they see the students have a better um, setup than, than they do. We have also a screening room, lots of virtual reality or augmented reality equipment to play with. And we have students that are working in that master's course that are there from January through to December, Monday to Friday, nine to five, all day, every day. So it really is like working in a, an animation and visual effects studio, probably like a startup is the kind of vibe that you have. But it's not like your regular uni course where you're there you know, five, six hours a week or something like that. It's really immersive, so very interesting. I, won't, I could talk a lot about it, but I, I won't. But suffice to, suffice to say that the students are uh, very talented. They do a lot of animation for the screen, but we also do a lot of stuff, like more innovative stuff, where we get them to use the skills they have in visual effects and drawing and animation and so on. We get them to use their, those skills in other areas than they might naturally think of, like maybe data visualization or an augmented reality, virtual reality. Um, I've got an example of some projects later on that will give you a bit of a flavour of that. Um, so the themes from my research and the research groups that I'm a part of is basically practice-based research. We are not theorists as such. I mean, we make contributions to theory, but we do that through making things. Through, so through being involved with real-world projects, making what we believe are innovative sort of uh, technologies or making innovative use of uh, new technologies. We do interesting things and through that we learn uh, what techniques are, are effective and what techniques are ineffective and through that sort of come to contribute to theory about how to make things that work, how to, how to make good, good designs. The first project I'm going to talk about, which I think is an example of blurring the line between virtual and physical, is a recent PhD graduate of ours, Alon Nilsa, who is a professional drummer. He plays the, like acoustic drum kit professionally and has toured around the world doing that. But he made for his PhD the air sticks, which are basically kind of like glorified Wii controllers that let you play the drums without drums. So by going like this, you could get trigger the sounds of ticka 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 ticka. Um, and so his PhD was all about what are the implications of that. It's not really that interesting just to play physical drum sounds without drums, although that is kind of interesting. But he's more interested in like, how does this open up new possibilities for different kinds of percussive music and for different kinds of performance performances, also including um, uh, graphics as well. Because as far as the computer is concerned, the gesture is just numbers. You can link that to sound, you can link it to vision, you can link it to anything that the computer can do. That sound's coming out of my laptop. Just let me pause for one sec, I'll just see if I can switch the sound to the big speakers. You get a sense of what's going on there. So what Alon's thesis was about was like, how do you map gesture to sound and vision? What are the opportunities that it opens up? And how does he think about music differently when he's interacting with something like this? And he did probably a thousand performances um, using the air sticks, all different kind of contexts, and solo stuff, but also playing with other like acoustic musicians and stuff like this. So um, yeah, so he's uh, definitely exploring those boundaries between physical gesture and a very traditional instrument like the drum kit and the digital world. Uh, maybe. I, I always, I guess I have to play this because this is, this is a project I've been involved with for many years. Uh, but this is a collaboration we have with actually with a dance company, Stalker Theatre, 
Um, and this is a performance, I'll just turn it down, um, for, that we developed with them for a children's show. Well, they developed the children's show, but we developed the interactive technology. So there's a cameras that are on stage there that are tracking their, the performers' movements and feeding that into the interactive graphics that you can see. Um, and so we developed the technology and then we also interviewed everyone involved with the production, like the dancers, the choreographers, the directors, the people who are selling tickets, the CEO of the company, to try and get as holistic a picture as we possibly can about the impact of technology on this company. Because prior to our work with them, they, they hadn't used tech in their work, they were a traditional kind of dance company. So the research was not only developing the system, but understanding the relationship between um, the relationship between the technology and the, the practices of that company. And it really has transformed them. They're now basically a, a new media company actually, and they're selling uh, installations and performances uh, sort of around the world. So we just got back from the tour in Shanghai like about, about three or four weeks ago. Um, so yeah, that's another example of where the a traditional physical kind of very physical kind of art is incorporating digital stuff and, we look, and the relationship between those two those two things another i've got lots of videos so that's why i kind of prefer to play videos for talking because i see people tune out after about five minutes of talk and then if i play a video everyone starts to watch again but this is another uh, work by PhD student Sam Rippingale, who's at the Animal Logic Academy. Um, and this is a animation we actually developed for the uh, Air Force. So they had a, a problem that they identified that basically there weren't enough female pilots coming through. Um, and they wanted to address that issue. Um, and so we, through discussions with them, we eventually came up with the idea, or Sam came up with the idea of a young girl who dreams of flying. Um, as a way to kind of get it on the radar, but just for young girls to be thinking about being a pilot, any kind of pilot, doesn't have to be an Air Force pilot, but just to get it on the radar for them as something they could do, and as also a way to motivate them to stay with STEM subjects, because if you don't have STEM uh, subjects, you can't be a flight pilot, you, those are so necessary. But where the, where the smirchal thing comes in is all these trees that you're seeing here in the shot, are all actually miniature trees that are shot with a camera mounted on the end of a robot arm. So some are constructed like that beach that you she's about to land on in a second. Spoiler alert. Um, that that is all actually made, so it's a physical set, sort of about as big as the uh, half of the stage at the front here, I guess. And yeah, we use a robot arm uh, with a camera mounted on it to construct very precise um, camera shots. And then the character, Jasper, is digitally sort of superimposed on that using what are now traditional animation techniques. But the idea is you get a real nice blend of the physical stuff, the miniature set, and the virtual stuff. Again, we're trying to get the best of both. Is that the page there? And by the way, that is the um, the voice you heard at the end. There is actually the voice of the um, Australia, the RWS first female fighter pilot, who coincidentally, when we met her, um, has red hair and looks very much <laughs> like Jasper. So she's got photos of her as a young girl that look yeah scary. So um, it was all coincidental. Um, another example I've got here is a, um, Louis Pratt, who's doing a PhD with us. Uh, Louis is a sculptor, um, but he's been doing a lot of work with 3D printing and sort of uh, robotic fabrication techniques. And one of the things he's exploring is how you can bring in, for example, a 3D scan of a body, uh, a human body, and then apply some kind of digital process to it that is kind of you're used to applying on, on a screen. Like you might sm you know, smear or blur some part of the, of the model. And on a screen that looks like totally normal, we're used to it. <laughs> but what he then does is he takes that smeared kind of uh, model from the computer and 3D prints it, and then you end up with like a life-size 
uh, 3D print of a human body, but with the face smeared, for example. And when you see it in that context, it's a very different, you perceive it completely differently. So the, you can see some examples here of some of his, some of his work. So this is actually a sculpture, it's one on the, well, they both are, um, that's been 3D sculpted and, he's, and Louis kind of blended together three different, I think, scans of his body and his face and he's applied some basic digital processes to that and then uh, fabricated it. Uh, and another example over here, also a 3D print. Um, and then just to demonstrate that not everything we do is kind of in the arty farty area. Um, I mean, I, I, I sort of have a bit of an arts background, so I kind of naturally drawn to that kind of thing. And I also think it makes an excellent test bed for like pushing the boundaries of stuff where you don't have to get permission. It's kind of normal in a way to kind of go beyond the boundaries if you're in an art context. So it gives you a nice way of really pushing, pushing things in, in new areas. Um, but we do also do more grounded things, I guess, um, and we have done recently a, partner, a partnership with Retriever Communications and Transgrid and also actually Otis Elevators um, on how we might use augmented reality um, for field technicians in order to help them do more effective work, maybe and have access to the data that they need, kind of where they need it, hands-free so that they can actually be doing what they need to do to fix an elevator or to fix uh, some electricity substation. Um, uh, yeah, have their hands free to do that, but they can get access to the information they need that will help them do their job more effectively. Um, and so this is just a video of a prototype. Um, <coughs> the audio for this. Um, of a safety application. So when a site worker comes, sorry, when a field technician gets onto a, a um, substation site, the very first thing they're supposed to do is check the list of safety hazards for that site. But usually the safety, the list of safety hazards is often in like um, a, a remote corner of the site. And to get to that remote corner of the site, they've got to walk past about two dozen safety hazards. So it's actually much more effective, we think, if they have, say, augmented reality glasses or something along those lines. And then when they get there, they can just scan the, the site and these the, their safety hazards are marked up at the actual location of where the safety hazard is. And they can also enter their own safety hazards as well. So if they spot something that's unsafe, they can enter it and, um, and, uh, and mark it up. So yeah, this project's really just about, first of all, um, tailing technicians to get a sense of their day-to-day -day work and what the realities are of the situation that they're in. Um, and it's about then coming up with a series of prototypes, of which this is one of the sort of more, this is where we ended up, we can start with this. Um, coming up with these prototypes and then taking them back out into the field again and assessing, okay, well, in what ways were they effective, in what ways weren't they effective. Um, and pretty much any technician that we showed this to kind of goes, okay, yeah, well, look, there's still some, some clunky things about it. And the headset, the HoloLens headset you're using is really heavy and, you know, I'm not so sure about that. Uh, they kind of say we kind of get basically within five years we, we could be guaranteed we'll be using this because they can see the benefits are clearly there it's just a question of you know maybe another generation or two of hardware um, so yeah so it's a, but it's another interesting blend i think of the virtual and the physical you know, in a very very obvious way And I've got 10 seconds left, so I'm just going to go through like 12 more slides. Um, <laughs> so if I was to quickly summarise um, some strategies that I have uh, for, uh, for working in this kind of area, and this is, this is not really in-depth sort of theoretical contributions, this is more kind of like my thoughts um, based on practice in the last few years. Um, prototyping is obviously super important, that's almost a, a given. Humour is really important as well. It's surprising how often silly ideas, if you just dial them back 5%, actually turn out to be good ideas. <laughs> but you have to give yourself permission to go too far. So it's another example of the art thing as well. Um, go too far and then bring it back 10% and then that's probably where you should be. Whereas if you kind of, if you don't do that, you, you will never go far enough. 
Um, work with great artists, work with great people, um, like working with Alon, the drummer, working with a the theatre company, like they're already internationally known uh, artists. They already do great things. If you partner with them, something interesting, something interesting is going to happen. Um, uh, second last symmetry, the physical and the virtual. What I, our rule of thumb is if something is always virtual, or something's always on the screen, we should try and find a way to make it physical. And likewise, if something is always physical, we should try and find a way to make it virtual. So that's also another interesting kind of way of uh, starting with something. You know, if a sculpture, if a sculpture is always physical, let's make it digital and see what that means. Um, you know, uh, yeah. And finally, make it work just means make something. Um, so having an idea is great, but actually making it work, that's when people actually pay attention. <laughs> So if you, have, if you have an idea for like, oh, we can do an interactive theatre show, that's fine. And yes, you could technically say, hey, you could do it, and you could have some good ideas. But until you actually do it and actually put on a show and actually tour it and stuff and make it work in the real world, um, people don't really take you seriously. And you don't really get the research insights that you, that you need to get, I think. So that's my um, slightly longer than 15 minutes worth of presentation. Um, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them later as part of the panel discussion. But for now, I'd like to hand over to Vivica. So please make him welcome. Yeah. So um, I didn't have an organizing principle for the slides I'm about to show you, so I put them in chronological order, <coughs> which will do. Um, and it reveals something, which is um, what Andrew just said. If you, this, is, this is kind of, I just looked through various work that I've done over about the last 20 years for things that cross the virtual and physical worlds. Um, some as university projects, some as research projects, some for industry. Um, for all different purposes, with all different pressures and forces acting on them. But if one of the pressures and forces that's acted on them is maturity and time and better understanding of what I'm doing. And one thing you might notice as we go through is that as I proceed, more and more, the virtual and physical are colliding and becoming one. So, um, oh, so this, uh, that's my website. That's Ba or Chang, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong. This is a, a symbol which doesn't translate perfectly into English, for uh, it, it, but it relates to place. Um, so, yeah, but because most people can't type that on their keyboards, the other URL goes to it as well. So, yeah, play, place has been my kind of enduring interest and concern. So this is just a kind of giant mosaic, but I'll take you in. So this is um, the first work I could find. It's um, a, a virtual world that I built in 1996 um, for the web, which was a year old or two years old, depending, you know, how you count it. Um, uh, and it was a kind of a virtual panopticon. You could spin it around and interact with things and make things happen. Um, then, so that, that was kind of my undergraduate design degree. And then straight out of that into um, industry, um, VRML had just been invented. So by 97, I was, this is a fully immersive, well, for the time, <laughs> on a screen, right? There were not headsets that you could get for under $100,000. But um, so there was a briefly a flowering, kind of the last VR wave, right? There's one every 20 years or so, I think going back to probably 1800. Every now and again, it kept, comes back up the idea that people should be making fully immersive art that surrounds the viewer and encompasses their whole experience. Um, so this is, um, I was working for Beyond 2000, and we made a, a solar system. And then another uh, a client a bit later on making a virtual human. 
Um, now, I didn't design this physical object, but um, so I, I started as a designer. Um, I ended up dis discovering that design. So I did. I studied design in in an old school Bauhaus style design school. So you learn graphics, industrial, architectural design, capital D, every type. I thought I just wanted to do graphic design, but it turned out they forced me to think about bigger things. There's this Eliel Saarinen quote where, which says that if you design a chair, you think about the room. If you design a room, you think about the house. When you design a house, you think about the, the street, the streetscape. If you design a street, streetscape, think of the city plan. You just, if you're always looking one level of context higher than where you're working, you'll have you know, some ability to understand what you're doing and the effect it's having and what, it, what is around it. Um, so um, that's incredibly handy because um, it means that you can use design as a kind of a crane or a lever to do almost anything. You just look one level above. In this case, I designed the service design, the systems for um, using it. And I consulted on the technology. So these these are import devices that you'll see in lots of Westfields around uh, the world. Um, you can go into them and scan yourself. Um, uh, the and, and I guess that's kind of a step from here, with this virtual person to personalized virtual person. All of these things that were just research are rocketing into reality very quickly, and it's. People accept them very readily, which is surprising to me. Um, you know, proposing them when they don't exist meets a lot of that'll never work. But the moment you make one, um, people just blithely wander into it and scan themselves as they're going to the gym without a second thought. Um, making things real and prototyping is incredibly powerful. Um, so here, this this was the next thing I did, which was a, to attempt to make a startup to do a virtual Earth. This is 2001, about five years before uh, Google bought Keyhole and launched Google Earth. Um, so this was the this is me presenting at the SIGGRAPH conference in LA in a giant hall full of drunk nerds with laser pointers, which I don't recommend. Four thousand nerds with laser pointers. Um, it's not great. Never distribute laser pointers to your audience. <laughs> uh, especially not with alcohol. Anyway, uh, that was um, a very interesting time. It was technically possible at the time to deliver a, what this is, is a, a one centimeter resolution um, virtual planet. Um, technically possible is very different to um, commercially viable, as I discovered next. Um, so I, you know, having kind of just followed my interests, I ended up presenting at conferences and therefore, you know, kind of blundered into um, honors by research and an attempt at a PhD here, where this is one of, uh, this is kind of a mixed reality work that I did as well. So at, at none of, at, I guess because of the kind of design I did, I always assumed that you just think about the entire context and then everything that's possible. And I think something that I'm concerned about is the tendency to treat design as a vocational skill-based thing, right? So, I mean, it's fine. General Assembly is fine, but there is too much of it. Right? What, you know, what if General Assembly but too much? That's what I, I worry about. So, you know, um, you see a huge amount of work being produced that is just about what is currently what the current point in time right now like what is designed for most what is the most common type of so the most common type of design right now is a phone app right or it's you know something that goes on a screen and people think of themselves as designers and interaction designers when their whole worldview is constrained within the uh, these you know the pixels and i'm old enough to remember when that was 640 by 480 pixels and before then as well, but that's when people started thinking about design. And if you do that, if you teach that, just with, you know, if you don't teach fundamental principles, if you teach whatever seems to be real now, it gets old very, very fast. Um, so this is a mixed reality work that we installed in bigger space uh, at the Powerhouse Museum. 
which was something that Andrew was instrumental in making possible. Um, and it's it's a very technically simple work. Um, in there, there were floor pads underneath, the f like little pressure pads under the floor. This is before computer vision was really easy to do. Um, and as you jump on the floor pads, the, the so you start out, you see a screen with a representation of the room you're in, and as you jump on the floor pads, the, the representation slowly changes to kind of a where the wild things are, forest. Um, uh, that was surprisingly immersive and effective. Lots of kids used it and loved it. Um, the main thing we focused on, uh, and we designed this through, and like this is why I, I think the action research um, approach that um, Creativity and Cognition Studios takes is so powerful. We would have thought that to do immersive design, it's really important to have an avatar of yourself in the space. Um, but by iterating it and trying it with actual users, we discovered that far more important, like that, that introduced a tenth of a second lag, and then taking them out again and doing other work to reduce the lag was much more important for the users. So, you know that, you know, there, there's there's good research to tell you that, um, you know, um, delay, lag, and delay are a, a problem. Um, but without testing it on people and iterating the design, we wouldn't have realized that it was the most important factor in immersion in this, situ in this situation. Um, you might see a connection between this work and uh, my later um, thesis work. Um, this uh, came from a preoccupation with, so uh, you know, design usually tends to start with a problem. In this case, the problem of um, the fact that I was often I, I think by drawing, and I'm often in a different place to the people I'm trying to collaborate with, like the meeting that I'm in, uh, like the, the, the nine hour meeting that I'm taking a break from right now, where I'm collaborating with a bunch of people in Los Angeles. Um, I like to be able to draw and communicate, so I built this system that lets you use physical objects and cameras, it's technically fairly straightforward really, um, to do shared drawings between people in different places. Um, this is my currently paused PhD work. Um, to my great good fortune, nobody else is doing much work in this space still. Um, there was a huge amount of flowering of this kind of work in media spaces in the 80s. But um, immersive virtual reality is the trend of the moment and has kind of taken over. Um, I'll skip through some of the less interesting work. Um, Oh, okay. Um, I was I worked running R and D group at the ABC for a while, and um, when you give people tools to play with, they can often do physical, tangible things of their own accord. This was a a big uh, cross ABC workshop that I held for innovation and creativity, and one of the teams there made this physical um, pointer that they rigged up to the um, stats and analytics engines to see how much people, the sentiment analysis of how much people love the ABC at any point in time and the arrow would move around. So just a, a little actuator and a motor and um, a connection to um, a sentiment analysis of analytics engines produced this kind of very, um, very compelling thing. Or, uh, yeah, what else? Uh, and, okay, this, I won't show, I could, should probably have showed the video for this one. This is, um, at that, in that group, um, I was working on uh, systems for localization and recommendations. Uh, any of you who've worked in recommendation system know that this is a very live, active area of research. Um, people like Netflix have made advances. Um, Data61 has done some really strong work in recommendation systems. Um, it's sometimes a little bit hard to communicate. Um, what the purpose of it is beyond just saying if you watch this you might want to watch this other thing. These technologies can actually, you know, that people will jump to the first use, first idea of what a technology is useful for. So to open up the idea space, um, my team built this uh, design fiction uh, where, and there's a little video and uh, in the video people get their coffee and they with the coffee receipt, they get this personalized news feed from the ABC. And for the video, we recruited people without telling them, and we actually like custom hand-built, real customized, personalized news feeds for them to get their reaction. So it was partly a communications piece, 
and also a kind of uh, guerrilla research, user research Hi. base to see how people actually responded to the work. Um, yeah, and, and just making it tangible opened up people's minds astonishingly. So this this project, which you know had lots of milestones and budget and you know important stakeholders involved, with which very few people were really engaged and interested, suddenly became something that people were talking about and you know actually showing up to the meetings for and scheduling conversations for and trying to get it, trying to rope each other into because they could see even if this thing wasn't possible it's like Andrew said you know you, you take it beyond what's possible and just rope, pull it back a little bit and it can inspire people yeah so I think you know tangibility is very important this is just a, a my current role at choice we made an online community and um, if you are highly engaged in the online community, but we send you a physical pin. And um, people love the physical pin. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Um, you don't need to know about Laura, you probably know about this. Um, this is an immersive uh, property inspection tool. Oh, okay, and I'll, I'll finish on this one. So, the most compelling and successful thing we've done at Choice was um, to take something entirely virtual. So Choice had this database of free range egg location, or free range egg brands and the stocking density. So this is fairly dry information that was quite important because in Australia the, the term free range doesn't really mean anything in law, right? You can say just about anything and call it free range. But um, CSIO looked into it and kind of and Choice did research. And what free range means to people is you know, hens outdoors, no more than 1,500 um, uh, hens per hectare, which is about seven square meters per hen, um, able to get on grass, you know, these kind of things that, that that's what free range means to people. We had the data oh, for 20 seconds, um, but it was hard to communicate it. Um, and so we started with research about what. How do people actually buy free range eggs, right? And when do they make the decision? They make the decision in the shop. Very few people want to look it up on a website and look at a table. They really are doing their thinking in the moment when they see the eggs. So we built a, um, an augmented reality free range egg detector and it's just um, computer vision image detection of the box tops, the labels, calling a database of stocking densities which then generates this visualization of either loosely packed or tightly packed chooks. And um, this has been used in nearly three million, three million egg buying decisions in the last two years. Um, it's been downloaded 250,000 times. It's, um, it, yeah, it's, it's still being used 40,000 times a week. Um, it, it can be, yeah, blend, blending, like just thinking about how the virtual and physical worlds can work together seamlessly and putting in a little bit of tuning. We, again, we iterated the interaction design until it, it felt really clean and you know, just... We thought this was just a, an experiment that a few nodes would use. But if you make it easy enough to use, it's very compelling and straightforward. I, I, don't, I don't like the word intuitive, but you know, learnable. Very, very rapidly learnable. So, yeah, some things. but also in industrial design I at the University of Technology. And I want to talk a little bit about my vision on my research. So I will have a, a bit of a different presentation. I'm not going through a lot of examples, um, but later I'll show you a URL where you can download this magazine that I've created of my research program with lots of projects in them. So you can still look them up if you want. Um, 
Materializing Memories is, my, is the name of my research program. And the first thing I always want to do is explain a little bit about human memory, um, which I think is fascinating. And it's not well understood. Um, but I was wondering who of you have seen this movie, Inside Out? Some, oh, almost half. I can highly recommend it for many reasons. I love animation movies, even though it's not an animalogic one, sorry. Um, but Inside Out um, explains human memory quite well. They don't get everything right, but they get a lot right. Um, so very briefly, um, this is inside the head of a young girl called Riley, and these characters represent her memory and how her memory is stored. So if you see the, the yellow girl over here, her name's Joy, and she colors all the happy memories yellow. And the blue girl, of course, is sadness, and she colors all the memories blue, the memories that are sad. Um, so emotion is very important in memory, and if you have really strong emotions, your memories stick much better because they are stored in a different part of the brain even. Um, what's interesting about memory, or a lot of things are interesting, but um, is that it's a reconstruction, so it's not reproduction. And that's where the movie got it wrong. So if you look in this image, in the back you see all these marbles stored in these big uh, archives. In the movie they say a marble would represent a memory, and if you would find the right marble, you will remember. And that's not how it works. We have thought that until the 1960s, until neuroscientists figured out that um, this is not the way it works. It's a very intuitive way of thinking about human memory. Human memory is much more complicated in that it's, it's kind of like a statistical process, which is kind of boring, and it takes the mystery out of it, maybe. Uh, but it's how strong relations are between concepts that are in your, stored in your brain. And these relationships are based on rehearsal, um, how much you see things, experience things, talk about it, etc. Anyway, long story short, where would we be without our memories? Um, we would not have an identity. We would not have opinions. We would not be able to start and maintain relationships. We would not make plans, make goals for the future, and of course there would be no heritage. So we use our memory in everyday life all the time, even though we're usually not aware of it. My research focuses on what's called autobiographical memory, and it's important to mention because there's 250 odd types of memories identified in literature, which means we don't know, we don't understand it. There's different groups of people studying different, in studying memory in different ways. Um, so we look at memory that, um, that you have experienced and it's events of your life, which is very different from, for example, learning how to ride a bicycle um, or learning facts or having like traumatized memory. Um, so autobiographical memory is memories we all share with each other. And for instance, that's the social function that's mentioned uh, on this slide. So we use it to, when we meet people, we share something about ourselves. It's based on our own memories. Um, but also when you know your friend for a very long time, you share those intimate details with them as well. Um, AM is also used for um, representation of yourself. So identity, creating a sense of continuity as well. So we make life stories about ourselves that are, might not necessarily be correct. Um, and also a directive function, so about um, future plans, etc. So my research has a lot to do with remembering. Um, and I do that through design research, so using design as a tool to gather knowledge. Um, in the area of interaction design, human-computer interaction, user experience, and user-centered design. Um, so all of the things I'll be talking about is people-centered. Um, the areas I'm interested in, apart from memory, is also tangible interaction. And that's where the materializing comes in, physical things that link to digital information. So what we do a lot is we work with cues. And cues are little bits of information that help you reproduce a memory, or reconstruct, sorry, reproduce, not the right word here. Um, so this is one of my former PEC students when I organized a photography workshop in the rocks. Um, so my team is based in three countries, so in Sydney, Eindhoven, and Dundee in the UK. And whenever I get most of them together, we try to do um, a materializing memories day. We call it a making memories day. So in this case, I bought these letters M, we walked around the rocks and we tried to take photographs to basically 
to, it was for team building, but also to think about, you know, where do we want to go? What are our themes? Where do we want to see the research go? And what my student is doing here, he's taking a photograph of someone else taking a photograph. And that's basically what we do. We observe people creating media to support their remembering. And these media, they can be used as cues. Um, so why is this relevant for interaction design? So these cues, we have them on our devices, we create them through our devices. Uh, we use them in um, communication. Um, there are all kinds of media that you can use as a cue. It doesn't even have to be media. Sometimes people can be a cue or a location can be a cue. And we use all kinds of apps and websites, all kinds of things that we do in everyday life to support remembering and remembering practices. Um, and if I can point you to one app that I use every day that I think is a lot of fun, it's called Pick Your Moment. Um, it's, it coincidentally turned out to be a Dutch startup company. And what they do, they send you a random message throughout the day and ask you to take a photograph. Very simple. And you don't get time to think about it. You can't edit it, you can't compose it. It, t it counts down three, two, one, and you have to take a photo. And at the end of the year, you can ask them to send you a printed book with your year overview, and it, you don't have to do any curation, which is one of the problems with digital media collections. Um, so the materializing bits and materializing memories is about tangible interaction, which is combination of material and digital um, information into interactive systems. Uh, the two presentations you've heard before are quite high-tech. I would say a lot of our research is very low-tech, um, often because we do people-centered design and some of it is with people with dementia, for example, and you just don't want them um, with very high-tech systems. They, it's hard for them to learn how to use new technology, so we try to make it as easy to learn as possible for them. Um, now one small side check, for those of you who are interested in more academic stuff, <laughs> I'm hosting a big conference here at UTS in February. Um, it's an ACM sponsored, uh, which means prestigious, <laughs> conference um, on tangible embedded and embodied interaction. So let me know if you want to be involved or you want to attend. Um, if, if you know anyone who, for instance, we always look for student volunteers, so people who are enrolled as a master or PhD student usually it's PhD students, um, they can get free admission if they also help us organize the conference um, during those dates. So let me know if you're, if you're interested. Um, if you want to know more about Materializing Memories, then this is the magazine I've been talking about. So if you go to materializingmemories.com, um, feel free to download our magazine. Okay, one example I wanted to share with you today. Um, and I chose this one because it's a clear example of tangible interaction. So my team, my Materializing Memories team, is about 20 people, um, and not all of them have like physical or product design uh, backgrounds. So it's very multidisciplinary, which I really uh, enjoy. Um, but this is one of my Interaction Design students who can actually build beautiful things. Her name's Ina, and she's about to complete her PhD. Um, and this is uh, one of her prototypes uh, that she built. So her PhD started out about how do we create memory media, and it gradually evolved into reflection. So she's really interested in everyday reflection practices and how we can support that with technology. Um, because as you understand, reflection is often based on your own memories of what you've been doing, where you're going. So in this image, you see Ina with one of her prototypes. Um, What's um, important to understand here is that the media systems that she designs um, are supposed to trigger support as well as capture reflection. And this is quite innovative because a lot of systems um, only do one of these and uh, usually it's, um, it's not, it doesn't include the creation, for instance, of the cues that can later be used. So she designed three prototypes for a comparative evaluation. So we do that a lot in people-centered design because as you can see, this design is something that's really unique. If we give it back to people to test or to evaluate, then just because it's unique, people will love it. You know, that's the first response, like, oh, this is cool. We're not interested in that. We know it's cool. <laughs> um, so we, we designed three different things that are all unique and new, and then we let people compare them, and then, then they start talking about the actual functionality and how it supports them, one thing maybe better than another. Um, and the idea was to design for open-ended reflection, so we don't want to tell 
um, the people what to do with them, basically. We want to give them the freedom to use these um, tools in their reflection practice in any way they want. So these are the three prototypes that she designed. And so keep in mind, this is one study in a four-year PhD. She's done a number of studies. And of course, I'm not going through the whole design process, so I'm cutting it really short here. Um, but these are the three prototypes that she created. And what she decided to focus on was the different modalities through which you can um, reflect. So if you see dot on the left, and I'll show you a little bit more detail in the upcoming slides, um, that's very much based on the visual uh, sense. Uh, cogito in the middle is about writing, uh, the traditional way of reflecting and like writing diaries. And balance on the right records audio messages, so it's very much the auditory um, sense. I don't know if you can read that. It's probably a bit too small, is it? Can you? I can't even read it, so probably not. <laughs> Um, so Dot, what she designed is she designed an app um, just for on your phone and it connects to the photo frame over there. And the photo frame um, can show an image that you have created to support your reflection practices. Um, through the app you can select photos and we've had participants crea actively create photos to do this. And then you can abstract them. Um, so we, the participants um, use it in such a way that the more it was abstracted, the easier it was for them to reflect on it. However, they would choose something that they would still recognize. Um, so, do, yes, so that photo, for example, is, I think it's a person in the middle, and the person who took the photo will know that, but I wouldn't uh, if she wouldn't have told us. So the idea is it's very much a playful interaction on the phone. You just play around with your photos. You can choose how you want to abstract it, how far you want it abstracted or not and then you can choose what it shows on the photo display. And you can update that if you want to. Um, so that's DOT. Uh, Cogito was a little bit different. This was a tool, and so this is based on a lot of research into how people have reflective practices. And one of the things our participants told us is that a lot of it happens on the go. So people are, for instance, commuting is a great time of day where people reflect. Um, before they go into work, they reflect about the day ahead, and when they come home, they reflect about either how work had gone or what they have to do tonight, um, or even you know, longer periods of times. So during the commute, uh, people really love reflecting, um, but also during um, like boring tasks, like, I don't know, um, vacuuming the house or doing the dishes or doing the garden, um, people will automatically start reflecting on life. So we were looking for all kinds of ways in which we could support the creation of these cues. So with Cogito, people could send uh, text messages to um, this pyramid. And the pyramid, if you would open it up when you would come home, so all these devices are at home, the photo display and the pyramid, if you would open it up, it would show you some of the text messages you've sent that you aim to use for reflection. And then you could sit down and write about it. And the idea was that if you show them three messages, they will compare them or they would see trends or themes and that would support reflection. The third one, balance, um, a lot of participants put it in the hallway right next to the front door. So when they would come up home from work, during their commute, they would have reflected on stuff and they would feel like, I want to record it. So balance is, it's open-ended. So you can choose if you press if you see the metal circles on top of the white ball, if you press it, then you can start recording audio for 10 seconds only, so it's brief, on purpose, because otherwise people will just ramble, and that's not very useful um, in this type of system. So you could choose the left one or the right one, and it was up to you how you wanted to do that. So some people use the left one for work reflection, and the right one for private life reflection, or for things that were going well, versus things that could use some improvement. Um, and one of the things we learned about balance is that because it's recorded, people felt it was quite final. So they felt, I have to finish my reflections before I actually can record it, when it's worth recording. So as you can see, so balance was audio based, Cogito was text based, and DOT was visual based. Um, I think I've explained the rest. Yep. So we did um, deployments of each of these prototypes with participants. 20 seconds as well. <laughs> um, 
So we had them six weeks into people's homes. So we, we do that with all our prototypes because you know we can have theoretical reasons for why things work, but you know people just doesn't work for them. Um, and some of the things that we found, um, you can see some quotes here. By the way, I'm happy to share my slides if anyone's interested, if you want to take a bit more time. Um, so these are the different opinions about balanced Coviso and dots. Uh, in general, people liked dots because it was very playful, and they really liked playing around with the visual um, distortion, let's say, of the photographs. Um, but it was less, less reflective and less creative than the other two. So the visual easily like, dominates instead of supporting your reflection. We asked participants to rank all the concepts. So very briefly, uh, singular reflection versus connected reflection. So where more things come together. And you can see that, um, let's say that well, opinions vary. So it was very personal. So some people really preferred one medium over another. Um, but that a lot of the reflections were still single, where we wanted people to see bigger themes and, and abstract. Um, lighthearted versus deep. Um, so you can see that dot is more on the left, so more lighthearted, uh, whereas balance was deeper because people also felt they had to finish reflection before they could record. So people reflected, that was good. Um, during media creation, which is what we wanted, which was really innovative, um, also on diverse topics, uh, lower and middle levels. So we wanted the critical and deep reflection a bit more, and we saw that less than we expected, maybe because of the time they had the devices, which is two weeks each. That's always an excuse, I guess. Um, we also found that everyday life reflection does not happen at fixed moments, but depends on opportunities and triggers, and that's what we try to provide them with just these couple of prototypes. Thank you very much. Thank you to Lisa and to Vivica as well. Maybe we don't have as much time for questions and comments as I sort of planned for, because we all just went just a tiny bit over. But we do have um, five minutes. Um, so it's, and I noticed, no, I don't think anyone has used Slido. Correct me if I'm wrong. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'll just open up to the floor, I guess. Does anyone have any questions or comments for, for any of us or all of us? So in, in, in which case, 
my main method of preserving privacy is to try to avoid collecting personally identifiable information in the first place as much as possible. Um, having it means you have to deal with it. Yes, same here in terms of privacy. We have very strict rules here at the UTS, so you can you can never have names associated to any kind of information. So we we have very strict procedures for all the participants or, and all the, the researchers. But in terms of data, I don't. It depends what you call data, because of course we have a very limited um, interest basically in what we learn from participants, and it has only to do with in this case the product how it affects their reflection. Um, we only, um, we tell them, you know, it's voluntary. You can stop at any time. You can give us what you feel you would like to give to us, and you don't have to talk about things you don't want to talk about. So we don't log anything. We don't, basically, we don't have that much data, I would say. But, um, and then it's all with consent. So everybody who participates have to uh, read the form that we write for them to explain what we are doing, why we're doing it, and that if we would like to, for instance, we write academic publications, if we would like to publish it, whether we have their approval, and they can always change their mind. So if, I think it's different from big companies who do log a lot of data and then collect it and then maybe not know yet what they will do with it in the future. Yeah. We don't do that. Yeah. yeah, I mean, most of the data we get is qualitative, and you know, all those uh, things that Elisa and people saying it's going to apply. It can get tricky when you're working with commercial companies. I have a PhD student now who's looking at archiving and film visual effects companies because they're generating massive amounts of data all day, every day, and you can't archive all of it, even if you wanted to. And so she's trying to figure out like what is the best practices for them. But then they're incredibly sensitive about, for good reason, say because they have contracts with, say, Pixar or Disney or something like that that sort of specify exactly what data they can store, how they store, and who they can talk to. So getting access to them and getting getting their feedback on what we're doing, yeah, it's really, really challenging. So I don't know if we've already answered your question, but can we talk around it enough? It's a, it's a big call, so that's Okay, <laughs> <laughs> we can chat later anyway. Are there any other comments or questions? People keen to get on with their day? Um, can you grab a photo of the slides, all three of the slides? Sure. sure. Okay, so I'm just I'll give you this for me to me to say um, thank you very much for sort of giving us some of your morning to come along and um, participate today. Um, very keen to get the alumni a sort of spirit happening at UTS. It's something that we haven't really done a lot of in the past, and we're very keen to, to build it up more. And so this is just like sort of one one other step in that direction. So uh, so thank you again for that, and I look forward to seeing you at uh, the next event. Thank you.